Thank you, Andrew. Is this thing on? Yeah, OK, good. Hi there. Uh, we are the warm-up act for Jake Archibald. <laughs> um, and we're going to be talking about components here, it's, which is OK, by the way. That's fine. I'm good with that. Um, so my name's Dan. Uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce people, and then we're going to then we're going to have a, a, a talk, um, a brief talk, and then we're going to get into it. So um, uh, my name's Dan Applequist. Uh, I work for Telefonica, and I do uh, Firefox stuff, Firefox OS, and I and I uh, co-chair something called the Tag in W3C, which is kind of the technical architecture steering board for for W3C. Um, on our panel today, we have a panoply of stars. Here uh, we have Nicole Sullivan. Pivotal Labs, uh, who is a proponent of uh, component-based systems, and she's the creator of object-oriented CSS, Typomatic, and CSS Lint. Uh, we have uh, Alex Komorowski uh, from Google, who's uh, product manager on Blink and Polymer. Um, we have Pete Hunt from Instagram slash Facebook, uh, member of the React core team. Um, we have Soledad Penedes uh, from Mozilla, who's uh, working on things like Mortar, Brick, and XTag. Uh, we have Peter Gaston, uh, who is a creative technologist and uh, an author and uh, speaks about web components. And we're going to hear him speak right now. So without further ado, I'm going to ask him to come give a kind of intro talk. Tell us about components. Thank you very much. Um, OK. Better log in first, excuse me. Now my screen is locked. Embarrassing, but I can get over it, don't worry. I'm a professional, I've done this thousands of times before. Stood up here and embarrassed myself thousands of times before. Thanks, so good morning. I'm here to um, do a quick talk about um, introducing web components. I know some of you know them already, but I want to kind of give a little overview for everybody about basically the why, the how, and the when of web components. Um, don't use that hashtag. That's the, oh, no, that is the right hashtag. I corrected it. Good one. Do use that hashtag. I corrected it. It's OK. Um, my name is Peter Gaston. I tweet at Stops at Green. Um, I'm broken right for brokenlinks.com. I'm a te technologist and front-end lead, uh, which is a very cumbersome job title for an agency here in London. So it's kind of my job to think, to look at new and future web technologies and evaluate them and see when we can use them. And one of the things I'm most excited about at the moment is, is web components. So I'll be very much playing the role of the excited Everyman developer in this panel of stars we've got here. Ever since we've been developing for the web, we've been copying other people's stuff. Um, that's, there's no shame in that. That's how the web kind of grew. That's how everybody got their knowledge. I learned by copying other people's stuff. I'm sure most of you did here as well. Uh, the view, so view page source is one of the finest inventions of the web. Well done to the original early browser makers for kind of making that possible for us. Um, but as we've, as we've done that, it's kind of become quite cumbersome to copy other people's stuff. It used to be, you know, we'd nick a little line of code here and a line of code there, but then it just gets bigger and bigger and more and more involved to actually do that. But we still want to reuse other people's stuff, and we want to reuse our own stuff across our own websites as well. Um, some of the early efforts at kind of making this copying and sharing easy were um, Java applets. Uh, if anybody's developed for the web over 10 years ago, there's a very, very good chance you had a photograph of a house on a lake with a rippling lake underneath it. Um, that would have been made with a Java applet. And then we had Dynamic Drive, which was the best place to go to if you wanted animated stars to follow your mouse around the, around the window. But we started becoming kind of more professional with the way that we wrote our code afterwards to make it more shareable, to make it more reusable. We had fantastic efforts like um, Nicole's object-oriented CSS, which become like, you know, uh, very, very popular. Loads of people use it and have been even more formalized into things like um, BEM, languages like, or uh, protocols like BEM. Um, and in, in terms of other sharing, we've, a, we've even had kind of whole elements, whole UI elements, uh, libraries grow up to enable us to start using uh, to, to stop having to code our own carousel 5,000 times and instead copy the carousels of other people. Um, efforts like jQuery UI and more recently Bootstrap have enabled us to do that. We write our code in a certain way and things just happen. Um, and even bigger, much more um, uh, powerful ways of doing this and um, have power some of the biggest sites on the web today. We're looking at things like uh, React, which is written by Facebook and Instagram, who uh, Pete here is going to talk about later today, and our fantastic hosts, the Financial Times, have their own version in Fruit Machine. These are kind of um, template constructors you put in JavaScript and it outputs all the code for you. 
um, and you can power that through Node, and you can build whole very, very powerful scalable systems, but just based on this idea of copying and reusing other bits of code, other elements. So this is not an idea that web components is kind of a formalization of all these ideas. It's looked at all the things we've done in the past, and it's kind of said, well, people want to do this. Let's make a standard way of doing it. Let's make an easier way of doing it that hooks into a kind of the low level of the APIs and of the browsers and makes this much, much easier to do. So where the goal is reusability, the answer is web components. There are three, there are three kind of core parts to web components. Uh, sorry, beg your pardon. The first parts, let me gather my thoughts. There are three parts to web components. The first is what are known as custom elements. Custom elements, when I first read about web components, I thought they were kind of more of a background thing, and Shadow DOM was the big thing that everybody was really talking about. But in fact, as I see it, as I look at it, custom elements are web components. They're the core thing. Without anything else, custom elements are the bit we really, really want to use. The idea behind custom elements is that basically everything is an element. Everything we do and everything we have on the web is an element. That's kind of a core thing that drives the Polymer project, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but, it, but um, custom elements themselves. For a long time, we've had elements like um, image. And if you provide a source to that image element, it puts an image in the page at that point. And we've had things like inputs. If you say input the type equals a range, it outputs for you a UI element in a consistent way across all the different browsers. So. We want to do that. We, do, we like having those consistent UI elements, but why stop there? Why not have everything be an element? Everything we do all the time could be an element. So why not have, for example, a Google Maps element? You give it a latitude and a longitude, a longitude and it outputs a Google Map into your page at that point. Why not extend existing elements? So we can say the video element, which, you, which we generally have in the page anyway, also accepts video camera input. We extend it with WebRTC. Why not have Ajax calls? be elements. Why not put them in the page? We do that all the time. We want those results. We want to put those results in the page at this consistent place, so why not make this into an element as well? Creating a custom element is very, very simple. You create a new prototype object. You can add methods to it. You then register those elements into the DOM by giving it a unique name, which has to be hyphenated like this to make it compatible with current and future um, standardize HTML elements, and then you just tell it which prototype to use, and that's basically it. You registered the element with the DOM, you're giving it some methods, you're giving it some properties, and then you can just include it in your page. So you can do anything with that. That's exceptionally, exceptionally powerful. All of those things I just showed you before, Google Maps, the Ajax calls, the videos, they all start by basically doing this. But once you've written this, <coughs> That's not, I mean, that's kind of nice that you've contained all this, you've attached all these properties to this element, but then you want to share that element. You want to make it shareable everywhere. So that's where the second part of web components comes in. Uh, these are called HTML imports, and they are simplicity itself. They're just like including a JavaScript file or referring to an external CSS file, um, but it's using snippets of HTML markup, hopefully with all your attached um, behaviors. So you put a new link element in the head, you say it's, a link uh, it's an import link, and you give it an href. And then that allows you to take your custom element and <coughs> apply it to all of the pages on your site. But more than that, it also allows people to take that same code that you've written, that same import, that same snippet file, and apply it across all their sites too. So it's immensely reusable, which is really, really cool. The final part, the final core part of Web Components is the Shadow DOM. Um, Shadow DOM is a nice idea. It's not vital to, to web components, but it's it makes them really, really nice and useful. And it actually exists right now. Many of you might have seen this already. If you open up Chrome, and even in, I think it's even in Safari still, and you choose the Show Shadow DOM option, you can see the markup inside these UI elements that we use. For example, if you have an input type equals range, if you view the Shadow DOM of that, you can see it's actually built of other elements. They're just not exposed to the user. They're hidden inside that. And that's what a shadow DOM is. It's the DOM inside the DOM that's hidden from the, from the, from the user in, in most senses that kind of powers the element, the simplicity of the element. Uh, there are also a few things which aren't, aren't part of the web components spec, or, but are related to it and make it way, way more extensible and useful. One of them being the template element, which allows you to drop markup into your, um, into your document and not have it passed or not have it rendered until you explicitly tell the browser to render it. We have mutation observers, which uh, look for changes in the DOM and fire an event when they happen. 
and we have scoped styles which allow you to apply CSS only to specific elements as opposed to being globally scoped as they are at the moment. So who's on board at the moment? Most of the work is being done in Chrome. Uh, if you look in Chrome Nightly or, or, or the dev channel, there's a lot of this stuff that maybe you have to enable it through flags, but it's all in there. Um, because of that, a lot of it comes into Blink, uh, sorry, into Opera naturally as well as they're based on the same uh, Blink engine. Firefox are doing an awful lot of work in this as well. Um, custom elements are in there. I know they're working heavily on the Shadow DOM and the rest of the suite. Um, Microsoft we're not sure about at the moment, but I think the signs are good because they're involved in some of the extra stuff like mutation observers. And also they've got history in this. Um, Internet Explorer 5 actually had this thing called HTML components, which is really similar to what web components do nowadays. So in this case, kind of Microsoft is sort of the, the proto hipsters of the web component scene. <laughs> Um, finally, there's um, Safari and really who knows. Uh, <laughs> if you want to use them today, you've got two choices, or you've got two main choices. There's two libraries called Polymer and Xtags. One's kind of, they're both public, but one's kind of driven by Google and one kind of driven by Mozilla. Um, Polymer has its Polymer core, which is where you do the registration. Xtags has its Xtag core. Polymer has a, a, UI, a set of UI elements on top. And uh, Xtags have Brick, which do the same job. And they both share um, this platform underneath. They both use the same platform to polyfill where these things are not present natively, um, which is really, really good and makes it the, the fact that whether you choose one or the other, you're still working into the same code base underneath, which is really helpful for kind of moving forward. Um, the outcome that we get from this is meaningful markup. We get reusable elements. And hopefully in the future, who knows, even a consistent UI. Maybe the web could have a consistent UI like native apps have. That might be something that we want to move towards to make it easier for people so we can stop reinventing the wheel on every site we build. The challenges are, um, to put it politely, a prolif proliferation of crap. Um, if we let people create their own stuff, they're going to create some crappy stuff. But that's not a reason to uh, move on. That's not a reason to, to stop doing them. And performance, people have flagged performance, accessibility, and internationalization. And those are all the things we're going to talk about today. So web components are the future, for better or worse. Thank you. Okay, well, um, so uh, given our thank you, first of all, for that, for that uh, intro, um, I think that gives us a lot to think about, and I think it, it nicely uh, intros us to our first uh, questioner. I'm going to ask um, Yoav Weiss to uh, stand up, hopefully, and to, yes, thank you, and to ask the first question of the day. Hi. Uh, we're all aiming towards better page load times. HTML imports can include other imports. ES6 modules can include other modules. Um, to what extent does using components breaks web performance by breaking parallelism? So, performance immediately. So let's, uh, f first of all, <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to ask Pete to, uh, to maybe uh, you know, as you're a company that 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 has a strong uh, emphasis on page performance and on, on performance, you know, what's what, what's your view on that? You want to just get the trolling out early? Yeah, basically, <laughs> okay. yes. Um, well, at Facebook, we found that flexibility is the most important thing. That there's not a silver bullet to initial page load performance. Um, you can actually improve page load performance by deferring certain things. So, for example, we found that actually adding JavaScript to the page can improve page load performance if the JavaScript isn't driving an important part of the UI. At the same time, that we found, we found that the raw kind of, if you want to just say what is the fastest way to get a UI into the browser, it's server rendered HTML every time. So for us, we're not going to adopt a system that requires you to either server render or to client render. Um, I think that the, the trendy term for this is called like isomorphic JavaScript. But uh, every system that we have, um, we need to make sure that, it, that we can choose where on that spectrum do we want to server render or client render. And at which point do we want to push that data down the wire? Uh, which is one of my big concerns about Web Components, because it's blocked on the JavaScript execution, and it's tied tightly to the DOM APIs. So I want to go on that point. Um, so HTML imports, the top level import from the main document um, does block rendering, just like a style sheet does. There is an async attribute that you can use to say, do not block anything. And then within imports themselves, which are not blocking the main page uh, from executing script or parsing and that kind of thing, uh, you might have a complex interdependency of different things. 
we found it's much better in that case to, uh, it's much easier to reason about if you don't have, uh, if you do block those, those contexts as you're loading together resources. However, one thing to remember too is that uh, Web Components provides a set of new tools. They don't take away any tools. So there's certain best practices that we've discovered that will remain. So for example, when you're doing development, sure, you might want a bunch of different HTML components and separate files. But when you deploy to production, you might, uh, might want to compress those and minify those into one resource. We've also found that uh, you can do a lot of interesting things like um, using these tools and using async and um, some judicious uh, uh, use of it, some of this stuff. That you could, for example, define a very simple component that's just markup. Mm -hmm. It's actually in the head of your document, so that loads uh, very, very quickly uh, for the user, and then load the more uh, complex component and, and use that when it, after it loads. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I think I like HTML imports. Uh, they seem pretty good. They seem like one of these tools that you can use to shoot yourself in the foot or not. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as with many tools <laughs> on the web platform. And, yeah, I mean, like, like, that's a sign that it's a good tool. Uh, <laughs> can be a little bit dangerous to so make sure it's colorful. Do you mean that you would have multiple versions of the same component and load the simpler version first so, and then layer on a more complicated so the, version? Again, it's there. extra tools. And one thing that I think is interesting in this is with these extra tools, we found today on the web platform, we've got a set of tools in the web platform. Some of them are kind of janky and busted, but they're what we've got. We've added a few more tools on the end. What I found is that uh, we found a lot of best practices today that we've all sort of discovered using this set of tools that we've got. And actually adding a few new ones brings questions, you know, uh, opens a possibility for different best practices that are actually even better. And one of the cool things about this is I feel like on the Polymer team and people who are using Polymer and X-Tags, we're kind of the pioneers. We're discovering this stuff and saying, oh my gosh, that's an interesting pattern that looked really crazy before but actually now makes a lot of sense. So um, a number of folks have been experimenting with that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't yet know what the best practices are for every case, obviously. To come over to this side of the room, um, I, first of all, I wanted to ask Soledad, uh, did, did, you, did you have a performance-related um, comment? I have this thing, I mean, when you require kind of like complicated UI, maybe it's not a matter of a page. You're going to be talking about an app. You're in a different space. So I don't think you can really consider the same case. I don't think it's equivalent. It's like, you, you, I mean, Instagram is a different case, I guess. It's like you know, a hybrid between an app and showing content. But the case we, have, we are having with components is many times you're building a complex app, like with UIs and stuff, you really need to wait for the whole thing to wait, yeah. like to load, like before you can start, like, it has to block. But I guess, yeah. You can optimize and everything, but it has to block at some point. You, you need to wait. It's like it, any it, other It's all about option value, though, right? Like, we don't want to commit to a technology where you have to say, these are my performance characteristics. And the way that, I, um, that we're starting to think about um, initial page load performance now is that when you open your Mac laptop or you open an app on, on an iOS device, you see a static screenshot of the previous version of the UI before the real UI actually initializes. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could build all of our web apps like that? We could render it on the server, send down a static HTML page that can be cached, um, and reanimate it with JavaScript. So I'm just. I, I hate that. I would. I would, <laughs> I would. Kill but the web it, if but that you have happened. the choice, though. Okay. Would you want that choice? I, mean, I guess the point is, it's still up to the developers to figure out how best to use these tools for their particular uses. So right. can I say, as a, like a, a, a someone who's not involved in the high level of creation and, and kind of an end user of them, for us the choice often comes down to, um, is it better than what we've got now? So if we want to use something like jQuery UI or something like, or, a, or an existing UI library, do um, web components make that faster or better? I can't really tell that until we have them natively and they're implemented. I think, personally, I think they will be better, um, but I, don't, I can't really test that until we're all finished and implemented. I want to come back to the server-side rendering point you made. Um, mm -hmm. I know React has a, a mode where you can, it sort of ships down the, the rendered components uh, mm -hmm. directly in the main body. Um, we actually have found, this is an example where um, some people have explored using going all web components. Uh, teams at, at Google who are prototyping on this actually found they were people who are big proponents of server-side rendering they actually found in some limit, in some cases, th that it was actually faster to just heavily cache the components client side and then just ship down the, um, the sort of com the component based markup and have it inflate locally. That's pretty similar to what we found as well. Yeah. But we found that the best thing is that you want some of your components rendered server side, some of them rendered client side, yeah. um, and choosing that mix. Yeah. And does that yeah. depend on mobile as well? Because I think the rendering is going to take a lot longer yeah, client the, side on mobile. Yeah, the performance characteristics of how much CPU you have on the machine, network speeds, latency, that kind of stuff will definitely, I think. So um, I also, I wanted to open things up to the to to the audience here, and I'm looking over to Andrew. Uh, is there? I mean, where? How? Um, 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure. Um, so, yeah. Another thing too is that we found again the Polymer team in particular is on uh, is actually part of the larger Blink team. Mm -hmm. So Polymer uh, is the way I think of it is kind of almost a means to an end, of making sure there's good feedback going into the specification process because it's very hard to design complex specs uh, in a in a in a room just through discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also we're identifying use cases that make a lot more sense in the web components world, and we'll literally yell over and be like, you know, hey Adam, this is something that we run into a lot. This is a very common pattern. I say, oh yeah, we can actually you know. If that pattern is going to be common, we can do optimizations in the engine. So imagine in this new world, you'll see that different patterns become more common or, or things that are um, uh, will be uh, optimized. It's sort of engines. interesting, though, because if you look at the UI libraries that are out there, you know, Bootstrap or mm -hmm. uh, jQuery UI or object-oriented CSS, any of them, they're solving the same 50 problems over and over again. So while I really like web components and that you can do anything with them, yeah. I think maybe the browser should have solved those 50 things, like tabs and carousel and some basic stuff that's on like every site in the universe so that we'd need zero JavaScript for those things. Well, that's okay, actually so, a really so, good point. So we actually should should move on to the next to, to the next topic. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to talk about oh, well, maybe we can bring you can bookmark that, save it and, and let's let's bring it to the to, to the rest of the discussion. So um, next I'm gonna ask Jonathan Fielding to uh, to ask his his question. Um, so how do components help or hinder responsive design? Uh, given that media queries are often orthogonal to components, how do components play well with responsive design approaches? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna hand that one over to Soledad first. To okay, um, I've got mixed feelings about that. I think that you shouldn't be building components that know too much about the look and feel of the app. That seems to be something from the outside, I think. like. If you're like involving your component with um, aesthetics, maybe you're doing it wrong, I think. Like it should be about functionality, at least in mm -hmm. my view. And I think it's a view of everyone else. Like, and I mean, even you have Shadow DOM and you have scope CSS and things, you can't really put too much look and feel inside that thing because you want to be able to theme from outside and have breakpoints and everything. So if you put everything into a component, it's not going to be reusable, which is what you actually. And again, I think I think actually there's, there's cases where you don't want styling or you don't want to get too opinion. There are other cases I think where developers would love. I think Bootstrap is a great example where it's a well-designed set of things that you can use that play together nicely. And I think there's a lot of room here for like a um, opinionated UI components. But again, because people can choose to use them or they can choose to do these different libraries, but it's a tool and there's going to be a spectrum of uses. I think. Yeah, but you can really put the whole set of breakpoints inside the component. It's just going to be a component that works only for this page, and it's not going to work for another set of designs. That's, that's why I suggest, I mean, it could be nice, good enough. It, I mean, that's what we're doing, break. Make it look good enough so that mm -hmm. it's not that ugly, <laughs> mm -hmm. but don't, don't try to assume things that people are going to want. Make it decent, I guess. Yeah, I think web components kind of put a much stronger onus onto the developer now than it has to, and what's been kind of from the browser makers in the past, to, people are going to start seeing how hard it is to create, for example, a select element and make it accessible and make it responsive and make it work across platform. Um, and we don't have kind of these dedicated teams to do that. We have to work this stuff out for ourselves. We're gonna see this a few more times in some of the other topics we talk about, I think, is how much more of a burden that becomes on us as developers. But it's also like a good responsibility, the fact that we are shaping these things in the way that we want to use them and we want them to be in the future. So uh, you, you say burden, I say it's empowering developers. So to your point earlier, Nicole, you were talking about why don't we just uh, ship carousel, spec share the carousel and ship it. Before, uh, web developers weren't on the same playing field as browser vendors, so like we could implement some of these built-in controls using things like Shadow DOM that you guys couldn't use. And so one thing that we're excited about on the Polymer team in particular is this idea that people can play around. Like there's an XDAS uh, GIF that someone was sharing yesterday. It's really cool. Like, I, mean, I don't know if that should be standardized and shipped in browsers, but the cool thing is that people can use it and it feels just like a built-in element. And if everyone is, agrees that those are the semantics that we should use and everyone loves it, maybe that is a, uh, a target for standardization. Because now we have developers are empowered to experiment and to play around and uh, explore using the same tools that, that but, browser But how have. frequently has someone made a built-in element for picking something and in fact on my mobile phone it doesn't work? 
or in you know some other context that they haven't tested for, or they're really used to an Android browser, yep. and so they made it exactly mimic that, yep. and so then in whatever I'm using, yep. it feels weird and has this uncanny valley, <laughs> like it's sort of that thing, but it's not yeah. really quite that thing. Yeah, I think that um, this is kind of what we were touching on earlier, and what I really want to jump in for is um, there's kind of like two things where native apps are, are kicking the web's ass. The first is is performance, and like we can go into that forever. But the other thing is that the widgets that you implement um, on the web don't behave exactly like they do on, on native devices, or you don't have them rather. So you have to basically polyfill them, and they don't behave exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, while I kind of believe in the extensive the extensible web manifesto where we want these primitives to build whatever we want, it's also important to get kind of the integration with the system level components. So your you know UI table view actually feels like a UI table view on an iOS device, and it the equivalent feels like the equivalent widget on Android. So I'm totally gonna, with you on that. I'm going to go to the to the audience a little bit. We have uh, Remy Sharp somewhere. My question was for the previous discussion, so that might be thrown out. All right. All right. So let's uh, let's go to Jake. Yeah. So, so this is on uh, with regards to the responsive design thing. It, um, yeah. Like having everything as components makes total sense. But don't we have a fundamental problem that we don't have a component model for responsive design? Uh, when we use media queries, they are to the viewport, not to the component. So the question is about, you know, uh, whether media queries. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to, I'm trying I to restate it without restating it. Um, I, I read um, yeah. Tab Atkins wrote a very thoughtful article on this thing because to having responsive components that are just responsive to kind of in themselves and not to the viewport. Is, is a great idea and it's been floated many times, but there are very, very hard technical problems to overcome before that. Um, I can't actually remember exactly <laughs> well, what he so said. So basically, anytime you're going to have rendering that where the child can influence the parent and the parent can influence the child, you can have loops yeah. in your rendering and that can't work. Like we, that, yeah. that can't be a thing that can be implemented. And so, yeah, it comes up perennially that people want um, to be able to have like a media query on a particular element's width, but like we need to let that go. It cannot work. Okay. So Tab, Tab has a very thoughtful post on this. I can't remember his conclusion. It's been a number yeah. of months now. But um, one thing that we found is uh, in Polymer, where we really embrace that everything is an element, almost you know, to an extreme, is that you build your app kind of, and you, you're like, oh, I'm always going to be the top level thing. And then next week, you write another app that has like tabs with you know, different applications inside of it kind of. And so it's important as a component author to think not just how am I using this, but what other context could I be used in? And some of the tools, like media queries, might make more sense uh, for elements uh, as well. But again, there are some challenges to deal with there. Can, can, before we move on to the next topic, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry um, if I'm mispronouncing your name, but Narciso Jaramillo. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to echo. Thoughts, quick thoughts. You can, and it's up to the component author to do what they want. I think there's going to be a spectrum of opinionated UI components that are themable and ones that have no opinion on UI. But I well, think there's th scope style, which which helps with this. Yeah. Uh, but also, I think that you know that only gets you to a certain point, right? Like, um, at some point, you know, the appearance of your element um, has to be coupled with changes in behavior as well. So I think really focusing on the, the composition of elements and how you know. I've got a component, like, do I want that full drop-down functionality? Like, what if I want to add separators inside the drop-down element and that, per that developer didn't think of it? So we need to think it really in terms of composition, not only of styling, but also of behavior and the way that data flows between components as well. So before we move on to the next thing, um, I just want to, uh, good, Jonathan, you're on the queue. Quick comment. Uh, so uh, if you've got um, some functionality you want for the mobile, and you want some functionality you want for the, your mobile, some functionality for desktop, it's responsive sites, would you show and hide different components? Or? It's, uh, it's going to be up to the developers in different cases. 
Um, we've played around with on the Polymer side. Um, most of the UI elements we have now are just explorations. Well, and just like just like building the UI libraries of uh, you know that have come up until now, I think there are UI libraries that are very opinionated. Like this thing is going to be exactly this width, and it means you can only use it when uh, magically that's the width you need. Um, and the better UI libraries and the ones that have sort of emerged are the ones that build tabs that fill in whatever space is available. But, uh, and that's and still going to be true there was in also a web a, There was also a earlier, part, as part of the earlier web component suite, there was an idea of these things called decorators, which are um, HTML markup applied with CSS. So you could apply, uh, you could apply different markup to, and use your media queries in that way. But again, there were like insurmountable technical <coughs> problems in doing that, and that's had to be dropped. So I don't think this is something that's going to be easily, easily achieved. So I'm going to have to cut it off there because we <laughs> need to move on to the next thing, which is Joshua Peak. Can you please speak your mind? Yeah, can we get him a mic? <laughs> Hi, I've, uh, I've done a lot of work on uh, GitHub's implementation of content security policy. Um, I'm wondering how web components fit into CSP. Uh, Polymer and other polyfills make use of eval and HTML imports to really declare the scripts in line. Um, in general, how are how will web components become another attack vector, and what's the general story for security in web components? So again, we're adding we're adding some new tools. We're not taking others away. It is possible to use web components um, within a very restrictive CSP environment. Uh, for example, Chrome apps you have a very restrictive CSP environment, and uh, although by default in Polymer we recommend people define their script right in line with the templates. Uh, there's a version of our Vulcanized tool that will allow you to uh, actually have those as external scripts that will obey uh, CSP policy and not be about in the main uh, context of the page. So. Other thoughts on security in general as well. Like it, it really occurred to me when, when I was reading this question about, um, you know, can the, the, I think I added the thing about can, 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 the, can web components be a, a, a vector for attack? In some way, and, and I guess I th thoughts on that from any of the any of the panel. Have you think, thought about that? I think we should be fine. I mean, you still have the same uh, content origin restrictions. This is still JavaScript. It's not different JavaScript. This is still thing that is running the same way that all the other JavaScript is running. Right. So you should still get your browser angry if you do something inappropriate. So I think we should, we should be fine. Haven't tried to break it yet. And there there are a number <laughs> of attack vectors. If you use third party content, for example, if you don't have uh, if you don't use uh, CSP and, uh, and cores effectively, there's, a, there's attack vectors on the web today. This doesn't change any of that. If you're using someone else's hosting of the components, like sure. Uh, to be clear, by the way, uh, Shadow DOM does not provide a security boundary. That's a misconception that sometimes we see from people. Um, we have iframes for the security boundary, but uh, Shadow DOM uh, just provides a much stronger like, style encapsulation. But ultimately, it's a boundary that can be crossed on the page. Um, any other thoughts on, on security or CSP? Uh, that's really not my area at all. <laughs> <laughs> no? OK, maybe we move, we, we move, we move on then, actually. Um, in the, uh, so um, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, Stuart Cox. Can we get Stuart on that? Cheers. Yeah, so. Um, uh, do you think web components open the door for developers to abandon semantics? Are we going to end up with a million different homegrown <laughs> select widgets? And what is the meaning of a, a tag name if that happens? So I'm going to ask Nicole to, to field that one. Um, so I'm probably going to give a little bit of an unpopular uh, point of view here. Um, I like semantics on a gut level, but when I'm making a decision about uh, what to do for a project, I try to keep in mind what I'm actually trying to get out of it and what semantics actually give me. Because in a lot of cases, we give way too much weight to semantics when we aren't getting enough out of it um, for uh, basically the value that we're trying for. So basically, I think that there's semantic value in accessibility. Um, and we get that from ARIA roles. And now our roles, what I think is great about ARIA roles is that they're divorced from whatever markup you happen to have used. And so we're no longer relying on some implicit connection but instead, we're basically getting uh, the semantic value from something we can tag on to anything. Um, so I think that that's important. And then the other value that we get is sort of developer maintenance and how <coughs> developers will understand our code later. Because those are basically the only two things that use semantics. 
Um, and I think that actually being able to write custom tags has a chance to make it, and being able to hide a bunch of junky markup gives us a fairly good, not junky, but presentational markup basically, <laughs> gives us a chance to, um, to be able to have a cleaner HTML that contains just the things that are relevant to understanding what's going on. When you say abandoned semantics, I mean, we've, we've abandoned semantics. If you open up the you know, DevTools inspector on any page, you see a whole bunch of stuff that's meaningless. The cool thing about Shadow DOM is you can take that presentational gunk that's required and sort of store it off to the side. And so if you look at pages that are written in a Web Components style, you look at it and you can understand it. Like it actually makes sense uh, reading it. Uh, yeah. And I also think that we abandoned semantics because the, the components that we're shipping in the browser, things like input and select, they're great, but there weren't that many of them, as you were saying. I mean, there's no carousel built into the browser. And so this allows us to create that carousel. Maybe for the carousel there shouldn't be, just because right, it's right, an yeah, awful yeah, UI yeah. pattern. But, 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 but I'm, saying, I'm saying this allows us to create those things and actually represent them more semant like semantically in, in ways in the, in the documents. Yeah, right. we're thinking I, got, about some, I got Remy on the queue. I just wanted to pull in a, okay. sorry. Yeah? Can, can we get Remy a mic? Up here. So, um, well, we, we, we're rushing to make all these, these libraries, uh, you know, Brick, Polymer, and so on. We're, we're rushing to create uh, web components. Um, and th this kind of hangs a little bit off of the blocking thing, but we're making old mistakes. We're, repeat, we're repeating old mistakes. Like, local storage is a good example of new technology that came out a few years ago. The, there was big kind of, you know, throw of arms, and <laughs> it's, it's not asynchronous, and, and it, we're warned against using it. But we're, we're repeating the same mistakes when we have the opportunity with new technology to not make these mistakes and make sure that everything is, is good for going forward since it's a, effectively a clean slate, right? right? So, But there's no such thing, is there? Like, we are always going to make mistakes. Like, we're going to totally no, no, sure, screw sure. up. No, 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 I agree. Unknown mistakes that we're going to create in the first place, but knowingly develop against mistakes. Well, I, I think that a lot of those mistakes come from this, um, we're not sure if the browser is an SDK or a runtime, right? So like it wouldn't make any sense for you to have your OpenGL calls be semantic, right? Uh, but OpenGL is a very performant API. So why do the data structures that we render to the rendering engine we have available to us, which is the DOM, why do those have to be semantic? Why do we even think about that? Why do we think about like, we, we talk about, you know, we need to make this performant and expressive and like sometimes those are at odds with each other. So I think that um, the reason why you get things like synchronous local storage is because the fast API, the fast primitive, is an asynchronous call, right? But the easy API is a blocking call. And so we needed to basically make a decision like, are we going to make the browser an SDK? Are we going to make it like Visual Basic or are we going to make it like libc, right? Um, and it's, it's still this kind of Frankenstein the, the environment. The thing is the, the we the web community prefer the easiest solution. Um, we'd always take the shortest route to actually getting the thing live. So if it means we, we like, kill the performance in the browser, we'll take that route as a community, because we're great at copying and paste. Yeah. We're great at just ripping off other people's code. Mm -hmm. So if you have the opportunity to, like the, the baseline doesn't have those kind of blocks built into it or um, mistakes built into it, then that seems like the, the right. So Remy, this is, this is a very complex topic and I'm not gonna pretend to know all the details. I've, I've watched this be argued many, many times by very people who are much smarter than me in this issue. Um, and it inevitably, after hours of discussion, everyone goes, oh, I get it now. But it's, it's one of those things that's very hard to, to explain. I, I can't do it effectively. Maybe we have some of those smart people in, in the room. So, on, on, uh, <laughs> uh, so first of all, Florin Egger. Can we get him a mark? A mic? <coughs> Uh, I wonder if you're not uh, hiding a lot of stuff uh, in abstractions when we're using web com components. Um, um, doesn't it affect maintainability and, uh, and, and actually hurt reuse? Because we're building, again, the 100 different select boxes because we ha all have just a little bit different use cases. I think it, uh, using web components, it's very clear. Uh, it's it makes your code much more maintainable because you can think more in your local context. You don't have to worry about what other, someone else elsewhere in the page has done, what kind of styles they've put in the global style sheet. Because you have scope styles, because you have this nice encapsulation mechanism, you can think much more locally. And it's really freeing as a developer to be able to think like that. Because today, uh, if you have more than three people working on a, on a site together, 
they have to coordinate. They have to say, well, don't do this thing, and please make sure your selectors don't accidentally select over into my area. Um, and actually, we've, my personal experience, on a lot of people who have used Web Components so far has been it's actually far, far, far more doable. I don't know if anyone else. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's uh, like, the, as, I, as I mentioned before, it's like, is it better than what we have now? What we do now is we just get a load of divs with classes attached to them and attached to things to like that, and it's all put directly into the markup of the page. It's all in the DOM tree. Now, I think that what um, web components bring through encapsulation, through scope styles, I think that makes that better and more maintainable. Um, it's not going to stop people from writing, as I said, a proliferation of crap. That's never going to end. That's what we do. Until we find that maybe we settle. That's the web. <laughs> <laughs> proliferation of crap. Excellent. Until maybe we settle on you know, something like brick or, or polymer or the two of them together, come up with something that we're all so enamored with, and we decide to let's be mature about this and stop reinventing when, everything. When all have the time. we ever settled on anything? <laughs> right. Right. But, yeah. But one thing that I think is very important about this is that web components, to the extent they pretend that they're just other elements, to the extent that they're con taking configuration through attributes or methods and properties on the prototype, uh, and that they emit events when interesting things happen, it doesn't matter how they're implemented on the inside. So you can use an X tag component right next to a Polymer component or within one another, and it just works. So, so I, I agree with the spirit of, of abstraction and encapsulation, but web components deals primarily with scope style. And honestly, Nicole saw that a couple of years ago. And with object-oriented CSS, um, so I, I think that well, that's solving. Except that in order to make object-oriented CSS work, you have to have a lot of developer rigor, and everybody mm -hmm. has to be on the mm -hmm. same page about making sure. And right. it isn't even on the same page. Okay, so you know, when someone's just learning CSS, they're going to make a thousand mistakes before they're ready to write something that's really encapsulated. And then there are other problems where you can't encapsulate it, right? Yeah. Everything styles are going to flow through to children. Yeah, like yeah you I'm, can't I'm speaking from like a very Facebook-specific perspective where we can control our engineering organization. Yeah. But the problem is, is that like that's that's the easy part. Um, you do that. <laughs> but then, and also, that, that's hard. That's hard for for just like, even a large organization where true. everyone's being paid by the same person. We we run into this at Google all the time. Well, we. We have okay, a rule of like single class name for. Um, can, can before I, can we move I on to the next yes, quickly, ahead, yeah. I have experience of building things with components, reusable things, and they work great. If you want, I can show you. Like, if you don't trust <laughs> any, all these guys there. Okay, so wait <laughs> like, for the break. Yeah. Um, what, one more comment, maybe, uh, from the audience before we. Yeah, um, Guy from yeah. Akamai. So can I we get a. Yeah, just a brief. I mostly wanted to kind of highlight some of the uh, comments that Remy was getting to. So, I mean, when you look at the existing successes we have, like Node was, is you know, one of its claims to fame is that it forces you to be asynchronous, right? The, uh, um, a, a lot of the problems that we have on the flip side of that, if you look at the async uh, widgets that, uh, you know, anything that didn't ship as async widget before, for Google, at least Facebook, for Twitter, we're stuck with those things now. So I do think that there's strong merit in taking taking away some of the flexibility uh, for in favor of performance or in favor of <laughs> keeping it, helping it, you know, making it a little bit harder to shoot yourself in the foot. So, so to, be, to be clear, um, HTML imports don't block scripting, script and parsing of uh, the main document. They don't, uh, they do block rendering just like style sheets do today. But again, if you want to render something fast, you can put things directly in your document. You don't have to use HTML imports for everything. Right. It, the the recurring the, theme within Facebook engineering is one word and it's predictability. It's like you want to know what's going to happen when you do something. With Node, you know everything is going to be async out of the box unless you're using a weird like C extension, right? Um, with the DOM, like yes, there is a fast path, but it's so easy to fall off the fast path. Like you don't know what's going to happen. You have no no idea to predict or no way to predict what's going to happen because you have to reason about the entire system as a whole, which I think is an argument for building abstractions on top of, you know, fast underlying primitives like you talked about. Um, and I think that's the way forward. Um, I don't think baking more functionality into this unpredictable DOM is the way forward. We're going to move on. I'm sorry, Christian, but you'll have a chance to talk later. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next topic uh, is going to be introduced by Cormel Lesinski. Hi. Uh, what's, the, what's the story of internationalization of components? Uh, does the user of the component can uh, inject strings in the component, or does the component have to have hooks for internationalization? Again, this is an area where uh, the best practices that people are still being pioneers in this space to see what these new tools uh, do. In different cases, it will, it will depend, uh, I think. But we were experimenting with a number of uh, approaches on Polymer. I think that it will depend for different code bases, potentially. I can't speak to the spec, but we've been building component architectures at Facebook for a long time, and it's made internationalization a lot easier. 
um, because your components, you basically say, hey, this, this is my internationalized text label component. And you drop that in wherever you need internationalized text. Or, um, you know, and within that, you can have tokens like, oh, this is my, um, this is my user's gender component. And it'll know, you know, it'll look at the user object and it'll say, oh, is this male or female? Um, and you know, put the right string in there. And so when you build with a component architecture, the composition possibilities make internationalization a lot easier. Yep. And we built tooling around that um, for our own systems, uh, including React and XHP, that um, <coughs> kind of people don't even really think about it so much. They just wrap their strings in the right tags. This will be one where I think, sorry to bang on the same drum again, but it, it, all, it puts more of the emphasis on you doing the right thing. Like if you make UI elements, and I think in most, like mostly, if I'm not mistaken, all of the UI elements we have at the moment don't include any text by default. So you just drop your own values into there. But if you create a UI element that does have text in there by default, the onus is on you to put something in there to make that internationalized. Or you know, make your work open source and let other people do that for you. <laughs> so one, one meta point I want to make is that um, because web components are, uh, get this interoperability uh, for very cheaply, like I think X tags and, and Brick interoperating with Polymer is a great proof point for that, it means that Today, it's different than what happens today. So today, as a developer, you pick a framework, right? At the beginning, you say, okay, well, this framework has 20 widgets that look pretty good, I guess. But then you get to them, and there's, uh, you know, maybe their calendar widget isn't accessible or isn't internationalizable. And because the competition is on the framework level, you don't necessarily get the framework at the component level. Whereas it, with web components, it's Well, close, sure, but how much, you know, thinking of the frameworks that we have today, the mm -hmm. amount of stuff you have to pull in in order to make any one, I mean, you could choose, pick and choose, and take you know one piece from one framework and one bit from another, but the amount you have to pull in in order to do that, I, my worry is that each component is gonna depend on a whole bunch of uh, dependencies, and they're gonna end up actually pulling and in and way too the, much. Part of the reason that's the case today is because uh, we have to create our own <laughs> parallel universes and use the DOM just as sort of the rendering layer, and that's it. Um, actually, one of the cool things about Polymer is most of the code size is that layer of polyfills, which is completely unnecessary if, that, if the browser you're using ships Shadow DOM, custom elements, HTML imports, et cetera. So it goes, it goes way, way, way down in size as browsers ship those natively. Hmm. So. Back to the topic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think uh, custom elements are just DOM elements. So you can just use your current library for inter internationalization. Say I18N. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or L10N. Um, <laughs> yes, I've been, I've been trying some tests and it works great with mobile and everything. You just do us, like add your custom data attributes to translate things and it translates things. I mean, it's just another element. So it's, it's just that once you create it, but it works like any other thing works. <laughs> yep. Any other comments, Nicole? Did you want to, no, okay. Uh, okay, so I think given that, we'll move on to our next possibly related topic, uh, which is uh, which is going to be asked by George Thomas. Hi. How can web components be used to enhance accessibility? Can shared standards for interaction be developed and agreed upon for common components? So we, accessibility is incredibly important. Actually, Alice Boxhall, who's going to be speaking in one of the later uh, panels, is on the Chrome accessibility team has been working very closely with some folks on the Polymer team and uh, the Web Component Standards folks. Um, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't yeah. rattle too much into general accessibility issues because we're gonna have a whole panel on that later. So I was almost reluctant to feel this question in the panel, but, I do, but you know, what are the Web Component specific issues that have cropped up around accessibility? So our understanding or, or belief, and Alice can correct me if I'm wrong here, is that actually uh, we think that it should be possible to make things just as accessible as before. Um, but in addition, because people can be, because uh, there can be competition on the level of components, there'll be much more pressure on uh, component authors to create accessible and nationalizable components. And so actually, accessibility is one of those hard things for developers to wrap their heads around sometimes. It's one of those things they put off till the end. But if you use a component that's already access made accessible, that's actually great for users because it's more likely that uh, you don't have to do all that thinking yourself every single time you use it. So I'm actually more, uh, I'm hopeful that the accessibility story will get better. Well. It's hard to see it getting better than native UI controls, though. And you can, yeah. So the best practices of using native UI controls where necessary or where, where uh, relevant makes sense in an ARIA as a, as a fallback if you don't, for some reason. So I'm like, I'm like the world's biggest DOM hater here, and I'm excited <laughs> about Shadow DOM because um, being able to style a select component mm -hmm. is like the prime example of how awesome uh, Shadow DOM is, I think. 
because like we have um, our custom select element component at Facebook that matches our interface guidelines, and it's like a zillion lines of code, um, and then a zillion extra lines of code on top of that to get like the tab behavior right for accessibility. Now, the browser and the operating system are already, have already done all that work for each platform, so we can leverage that with Shadow DOM. So I'm really excited about that. Um, additionally, um, the way that we, we use a component architecture at Facebook, we don't use the web component standard, but we use the same kind of ideas of encapsulated UI elements rather than templates, um, or traditional MVC, is we have a library that has been developed that is already accessible and ready to go. And you just, you know, people who don't um, know much about accessibility just go in, pull a component off the shelf, drop it in. Yeah, I mean, the, we, we've been talking a lot about kind of creating your own totally bespoke custom elements, but we shouldn't forget that that's a big part of it as well, is extending ex existing elements becomes very, very easy through web components as well. You can take your select box, which we seem to be using as the default go-to for whenever we talk about it, and just add your own things to it. But the underlying, you know, the, the markup inside that, inside the Shadow DOM, still remains as accessible as it was before. When we are creating our own elements, again, we have to build, we have to bake the accessibility into it. But you can put ARIA roles onto these things. You can do all that. If you view the shadow DOM of any element that exists out there, you'll see that they've got ARIA roles in there already. We should be using that as a model of best practice. Yeah. But it is a concern people because people. I, 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 question. I know there's a lot of accessibility thrown around here by not experts. I'm very really <laughs> scared of what's going on here right now. Okay. So we have well, a whole session on that later. And we're going to talk about ARIA later, actually, yeah. I, I, I think. Yeah. Um, I do notice that there we have zero people connected to the, to the, to the, to the system. So, okay, that's what I thought. So if there's somebody who wants to ask a question related to this, okay. Um, yes, Jeremy. So yes, this is related to accessibility and semantics as well as you pointed out, Nicole. It's one of the reasons for semantics to exist is uh, this exposing hooks, for example, to assistive technology. But to say then, we're all sort of because we've got ARIA, so no problem. First of all, ARIA is intended as a stopgap solution, working towards native semantics. That's the end goal. ARIA is to get us there. And also, <coughs> the whole point of web components is that we can invent these new you know, browser elements effectively. But then in order to make them accessible, we are restricted to what ARIA can do. Then we're just passing the buck to ARIA. And unless there is a concept of ARIA components, then web components will always be using a small pool of accessibility hooks, which limits their scope, which kind of goes against the whole point of web components. <coughs> I, I, I agree with uh, uh, Christian that we aren't necessarily, I'm not an expert on an accessibility, I guess maybe this is better, best deferred to the accessibility panel. Well, well, you just need to make the primitives you have for composition as expressive as possible, right? Like, like the only way to solve this problem is to, to be able to compose more complex things out of simpler things that are accessible and somehow make the, the system as a whole accessible, right? So um, web components need to be, or whatever component architecture you, you use, need to be as expressive as possible. And it's not just ARIA attributes, and it's not just styling, it's behavior. And I think you have to be able to compose with a full, like the full power of a real programming language to do that. And you need to be able to override specific <coughs> bits of functionality. So part of it is kind of the architecture of the system you're using. Um, and part of it is the power of the primitives that you have, which is why I think composing with DOM elements isn't powerful enough. I think, I think you have to compose with like Turing complete programming languages to do this. I think you're also bringing up something important, which is that uh, the whole web community is suffering with the fact that the accessibility side of web standards and the web and and other side of, access, of uh, web standards don't talk to each other nearly enough and haven't figured out how it's supposed to work together very neatly. And so I think a lot of this we don't we don't actually have answers for. It isn't. I mean, yes, we're not accessibility at experts, but also. Um, we don't know how it's supposed to work together. And the, the, the standards teams themselves aren't really working together. Other gentlemen in the front row, can you introduce yourself as well? Hey, um, Matt Vaughan. Um, the question was kind of phrased of like you have accessibility on the web today, how does that apply to Polymer components? Is there anything Polymer and just web components in general can do that would be basically make accessibility, accessibility better? In other words, ignore what today is, if you could change it and make web components accessible, ignoring everything now, what would you do? Like for me, you could add lifecycle events saying, you're gonna get focus, deal with it. Like that should be part of the web component. That They have to deal with that at that point. Yeah, I'm not, not an accessibility expert, so I guess it's... I, I mean, this is kind okay, of what, so what the Shadow DOM is trying to solve, right? Like, like 
select boxes seem to be pretty accessible. At least they, they do the same semantics that the operating system does. Um, one of the things, um, uh, Nicole mentioned this before, is the more native UI you expose in the browser, the more you can reuse from, from the experts that have actually implemented it right. Remy, um, I see your hand up, but I, we are going to move on, and, bec and we are going to pick up this topic, hopefully, in, in Christian's accessibility panel as well. So I, I, I hope that we revisit this as well. Um, our last question of this topic. Um, some guy named Andrew Betts uh, <laughs> possibly needs to ask this. So it's a, it's a longy. <laughs> Until web components are more widely supported, in what use cases would you consider polyfills like Polymer or X tags? Actually, I've got one already. Um, <laughs> in what use cases would you consider polyfills like Polymer or X tags over alternative component frameworks? To what extent do the existence of polyfills hinder or slow down the implementation of web components? So I think the, the I couldn't hear that polyfills. Oh, so the question is about is really related to polyfills, and uh, I, I think the crux of it is you know are are, are the existence of polyfills uh, going to hinder or or help the adoption or the implementation of, of web components you know within browsers within um, uh, in, in general in the developer community? Any any thoughts on that? I, I think it will help. It will help the adoption with other, in other browser vendors because it allows developers to use the technologies today in a way that actually works quite well. It's just when the native implementation is there, it's much faster. Um, so like Shadowdom, for example, is a very complicated thing to polyfill, and it's not possible to do it 100% perfectly. CSS, in particular, is very hard to polyfill correctly there. Um, and then when it's in supported natively, it's just much, much faster. It doesn't have to be done in the script. I, I see somebody who might know something about polyfills uh, asking a question. <laughs> Not specifically polyfills, but um, when we get to the day when we're including Polymer and we're including this other web component that comes from another website and another web component from another website, and all the magic is kind of tucked away between my X GIF tag. Um, <laughs> <laughs> those web components are going to be carrying all their own JavaScript, for instance. And what if they all pull in their own? jQuery library or polyfills library for all that, you know, they want a polyfill. Different versions of jQuery. Yeah, different mm -hmm. versions of jQuery. The, the version's not a problem because they're going to be sandboxed off, right, I assume. Sure, but, but that's a lot of the overhead oh, for having four or five web components where they're all pulling in a JavaScript library like jQuery, uh, that is jQuery but from different locations, how do, we, how do we deal with that? How do we not end up returning to the days of dynamic drive where we're just slapping in big blobs of code and going, fuck it, it works. Yeah. So one of the cool things about HTML imports too is they can do deduping of those resources. So if you, you different components can rely on the same thing and it won't be uh, redownloaded twice. And of course, if you use some kind of uh, minification step before you push production, you can make sure that you uh, uh, take care of that. But of course, if you have different versions of jQuery, you're going to want to avoid that as a uh, as a developer, just like you do today. You don't yeah, want to use. What I'm what I'm talking about is it's like I'm using Brick and Polymer together because you've got different web components. So I want to use both of them. Mm -hmm. um, how do I how do I get how does that even get surfaced to me? Um, so I, th what's I think the it's X the tags same. Pers perspective on this. I think it's pretty much the same. I mean, you have to be responsible. You have to be minifying. Just choosing the components you want It's just like if you just load the whole jQuery UI, it's like huge. And it's the same with Brick. If you download the whole thing, it's not that huge, but it's still a lot of things you might not want. But you can choose build your own distribution. Yeah. With, so I mean, you, you've got scripts for packing things like. As they do, I think we call it a smush. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> Isn't this like a fundamental problem with software, though? Like, mm. we've, it's a big if process. You, if you coded in the '90s, you know, like DLL hell and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think that the pipe dream of like pulling components off the shelf and dropping them in is is way more nuanced than, than people normally say it is. Um, like, for uh, for us, we just run it through a build system and we dedupe and, and alert when there's different versions. Um, but you're using your own web components, so you're not using anyone else's web components. Well, we we have a component-based architecture that like we own the whole stack. So, yeah. Yeah, so that and they also have a back end stack, that right. is component-based and matches up exactly with the, the front end part of it. So that changes it. So, so it's also practically today, Polymer and Xtags uh, use the same layer of polyfills below. Remember, that's a layer that that's where the bulk of the code is in, in Polymer in particular. And remember, that goes to zero over time. Is the mm. idea. I don't and see how that's true, though. Like, yeah, that's true in a really simple component, but as the components want to do all these widgety things, it's going to have the same amount of code that 
um, any library that would have done the same thing not, has Not necessarily, now. because to the extent that today a number of frameworks have no other choice but to retreat to script and to create their own world that uses, again, DOM as just a, a sort of dumb rendering surface. Um, in a world where you're, you're working more closely with DOM, you don't have that overhead where you have to create your own world uh, and create your own concepts in this parallel hierarchy uh, of script. In a, in a world. Um, <laughs> All right, so I'm being told from the front row that we need to wrap up. I think the, my, my personal uh, uh, wrap, uh, maybe closing statement might be a web components, some assembly required, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, what is it, vague but, uh, vague but interesting, maybe. Okay, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, thanks very much, and thanks to our panelists.